broadcast from News 2. The following special edition of Siskel and Ebert is brought to you by Orville Redenbacher, the first and last name in popcorn. <laughs> So this is Tristan. And does he speak English? <laughs> <laughs> Legends of the Fall. What do these movies have in common? Each contains work that either Roger or I, or maybe both of us, think is worthy of Oscar consideration. But the Academy might not be thinking the same way. And influencing the nominating ballots of the Motion Picture Academy is the subject of our annual special show that we call Memo to the Academy. I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And we don't make any bones about it. This show is for the 5,000 members of the Academy. We want to remind you of some of the things that were done in movies this year that we think deserve nominations. In the Best Actor category, for example, there are three actors who more or less seem to have nominations locked up. Tom Hanks for Forrest Gump, Tommy Lee Jones for Cobb, and Tim Robbins in The Shawshank Redemption. But there are a couple of other performances that I hope the Academy pays close attention to. And one of them is Nigel Hawthorne's brilliantly comic work in the new British comedy, The Madness of King George, which opened just in time to qualify for an Oscar. He plays King George III, the monarch who lost the American colonies and then went on to lose his mind. And Hawthorne invests this character with so much humanity, so much ego and frailty, strength and weakness, that he becomes both a monster and surprisingly lovable. You're a good little woman, Mrs. King. And we have been happy, have we? Oh, yes, <laughs> Mr. King. And shall be again. Another actor I hope Oscar doesn't overlook is Harvey Keitel, who has been very good for a very long time, but seldom better than in an unfairly overlooked film named Imaginary Crimes. Keitel played a con man who usually stayed just this side of the law with a series of goofy get-rich-quick schemes that exasperated his long-suffering daughters. We'll go. What's interesting is the way both of those actors, Nigel Hawthorne in The Madness of King George and Harvey Keitel in Imaginary Crimes, create characters who are probably mad, but who also have a full range of human emotions and who care for those who love them. I really like this about Harvey Keitel. He is consistently willing to play characters who are not likable, who are the center of the motion picture. Those are good choices, Roger. Mine are more mainstream, and I went this way because I think Hollywood devalues mainstream work at ha Oscar time. Oh, it embraces the mainstream heroic figure, but I'm thinking of performers like Nicolas Cage in the sweet romance It Could Happen to You, where he plays a New York cop who shares his lottery ticket with a waitress he's drawn to, Bridget Fonda. I made a promise and I kept it, period. Most people would have done the same. Nobody would have done the same. Are you kidding? I also respect the fine, unconventional work of Keanu Reeves as the hero of the ferocious action picture, Speed. For all of the tough things he does in this film, remember how much he enjoyed it when it came out earlier this year? Reeves never loses his tender side. I'm not sure how he does that. I think it may be that he's confident enough in himself as an actor to not try to conventionally toughen up his character. He has no chance of being nominated, but that's his fellow actor's mistake. Speed and It Could Happen to You are not socially important pictures, and that dooms these fine actors' Oscar chances. But boy, would I like to see the actor's branch take this work more seriously. Vote for the work, not for the role. Vote for the men and women who don't tear up the scenery, but let the camera just get close to them to see their pure emotions. Keanu Reeves and Nicolas Cage. I think I'd want them in any movie I ever made. They're and very good. And if I could good. put Nigel Hawthorne and, ha and Harvey Keitel into that movie with them, we'd have a heck of a cast. When we come back, our memo to the Academy continues with our suggestions for the Best Actress nomination. Continuing our special Memo to the Academy program, in which Gene and I both give lots of free advice to the people who are now marking their Academy ballots, I think in the Best Actress category, there is probably only one actress who everyone agrees 
more or less has a lock on a nomination, and that is Jodie Foster for her work in Nell. My two nominees for Best Actress, who I think are in danger of being overlooked, were in films that themselves almost got misplaced altogether. The late British director Tony Richardson directed Blue Sky in 1991, but then the film was put on the shelf along with a lot of other movies when the Orion Film Corporation went bankrupt. It was finally released only this year, and what a magnificent performance it contains by Jessica Lange. The time is the early 60s, and Lange plays the wife of an Army nuclear expert and the mother of two girls she has been raising on a series of military bases. Tommy Lee Jones plays her husband, who loves and understands her, and Lang puts everything into this performance as a woman who is frightened that she is coming to pieces. I can see it. I can see that radiation is coming off you. No. No, you get your damn contaminated hands off me. Another great performance by an actress during the year, in fact, maybe the year's best performance, is by a newcomer, Chrissy Rock, in the British film Lady Bird, Lady Bird. She plays an unstable mother who loses her children to the social services and foster families and then enters a long, tragic period when her violent temper prevents her from playing the game in such a way that she will ever get those children back again. And let me tell you something else. I know your little games, all your little twists block mommy out, but it won't Wait, Lady Bird, Lady Bird was directed by Ken Loach, a British expert in working class life. And where did he find this extraordinary actress? Amazingly, the movie is Chrissy Rock's first experience with screen acting. She was a barmaid whose friends entered her in a stand up comedy contest. And then Loach came along and cast her for this film, where she breaks your heart and drives you mad with exasperation both at the same time. It's strange, but three of my four acting suggestions have involved parents coming apart at the seams and yet still loving their children. But you know something, Gene? If they're really serious about honoring the best acting at mm. Oscar time, right. I'm going to tell you something. There was no better performance by anyone in yeah. a movie in 1994 than Chrissy Rock in Lady Bird, I Lady Bird. I felt the same way. We reviewed the picture the same way when it came out, uh, just came out, and uh, it would be my first choice. Mm -hmm. I've thought of two additional ones. Good. Uh, the two names I'd like the Academy to think about in addition to Chrissy Rock are first, Winona Ryder as Joe March in the fine, surprisingly fine adaptation of the classic novel Little Women. Just because this is a so-called family film, please, Academy voters, don't ignore Ryder's work, which is just as complex as her Oscar-nominated role last year in another more adult period New York story, Martin Scorsese's The Age of Innocence. Ryder plays Joe as the writer and dreamer she is in the novel Little Women, and adds the nuances of her being afraid of being trapped by love. If only I could be like father and go to war and stand up to the lions of injustice. And so mommy does in her own way. Yes. But I want to do something different. I don't know what it is yet, but I'm on the watch for it. I also want to stump for Miranda Richardson's performance in Tom and Bib as the suffering wife of the great poet T.S. Eliot, played very well by possible nominee Willem Dafoe. Viv's problem is that she is suffering from a hormonal imbalance, which was an alien concept back in the 1920s when Tom and Viv takes place. What I admire about Richardson's work is her restraint. Restraint as the illness takes hold, and even more impressive restraint in her later years after she's confined to a mental home. I gave Tom the title to the Wasteland. We worked together, side by side, for 15 years. I'm threaded through every line of poetry he has ever written. And he has my undying love. He will have it until the last breath leaves my body. Miranda Richardson in Tom and Viv. Film acting doesn't get much better than this. I want to say the name again, Miranda Richardson. There's also a fine actress, Natasha Richardson. This is Miranda Richardson if you're filling out your ballot. Okay. <laughs> It's ironic to think that there may be some Academy members who may need that guidance. I'm but... sure there are. Okay, when we come... They also need the guidance of how to put movies that they get sent through the mail into their machines. They stay away from pictures. What's a Tom and a Viv, you know what I mean? Okay, when we come back, we each have some more potential Oscar nominees that we don't want overlooked, as well as our recommendations later in the show for Best Picture. Peach Auto Painting and Collision does more... Continuing our special memo to the Academy, the Oscar ballots are in the mail and on this annual program, we gently remind the Academy voters of deserving work that should not be overlooked. Gently? Uh, gently, yes, yes. <laughs> and if not gently then, vote for these pictures. 
One person who was in that category, I think, is Walter Matthau, an actor so familiar for so many years that some voters may not even notice what an original performance he puts in as Albert Einstein in the charming new comedy IQ. Usually, Matthau uses a familiar bag of tricks. His voice and body language have created one of the most familiar talents in Hollywood. But this time, he does something new. He suppresses his Matthauisms and creates an Albert Einstein who is convincing, lovable, and very funny. Oh, Catherine, it's my niece. She's your niece? She's your niece? I, I can't have a niece? Well, that would make you her uncle. It works nicely, doesn't it? In the best original screenplay category, I hope the Academy voters don't forget the amazing invention of Boaz Yakin and his script for Fresh, which he also directed. The movie tells the story of an 11-year-old street kid who turns the tables on the powerful but evil people in his life. Maybe it ain't Esteban. He did it himself, man. We ain't gonna get $5,000, man. We ain't gonna get it. Another name I hope the Academy honors with a nomination is that of Krzysztof Kieslowski, who a lot of people think is the best director now active in Europe. This year, he finished a great trilogy of films named Red, White, and Blue, but Red was not eligible for a nomination as best foreign film because of the idiotic wording of the Academy's bylaws. That shouldn't prevent the voters from nominating Kieslowski as best director, and he deserves it for an extraordinary body of work culminating in this story about the unrequited love a retired judge feels for a beautiful young model. May she see. So, Matthau for supporting actor, Boaz Yakin for screenplay, and Kozlowski for best director. I think uh, I like the Yakin nomination, and also um, it'll be the director's branch. And this is sometimes, I think, the smartest group of them all. And they might reach out and embrace that whole trilogy and give Kieslowski the nomination. I hope so, because his movie was made ineligible for foreign film because they couldn't decide if it was Swiss or French. Every year they have some controversy like this that has nothing to do with the quality of the film, but only has to do with their archaic bylaws. And when we come back, more picks this time from me as we continue our memo to the Academy. What a our special memo to the Academy, let me take you now through an assortment of categories to find some more worthy, if unlikely, nominees. Why not, I ask, why not Cameron Diaz, the bombshell in The Mask, as Best Supporting Actress? Movies are very much about physical impact, and Diaz was impactful, to say the least. Should the award go to her genetic code or her aerobics instructor or her wonder bra? No, I think she's more than just a body. I think she is an actress giving a performance here, a knockout with a slowly developing attraction for the nerd, played by Jim Carrey, who becomes the superhero in The Mask. Baby, I also want to commend the production design by Tom Duffield for Ed Wood, Tim Burton's tribute to a man who loved making movies, even though he wasn't very good at it. The gorgeous black and white photography by Stefan Chapsky is a lock to be nominated, as well it should be. But voters should also look at these tacky sets and see just how great they look. That's not an easy achievement. That's Tom Duffield's work. That cardboard headstone tipped over. The, this graveyard is obviously phony. And finally, I suggest nominating the screenwriters of Legends of the Fall, who I hope will be nominated in the adapted screenplay category for taking a novella by Jim Harrison, originally published in Esquire magazine, and making its many characters fit so well in a great two-and-a-half-hour movie. I taught you to think for yourselves. That's what I taught you. And to defend what's ours. Yes, what is ours? What is ours? Well, we've already lost two of our cousins at the mine. And we've never even met. And don't talk at me, boys, if I've never seen a war. The action of Legends of the Fall spans many years and cross-cuts constantly, and everything is kept in balance. A great achievement. Edward Zwick may be nominated as Best Director. Here's hoping his writers, Susan Chilliday and Bill Whitliff, aren't forgotten either. Those names again, Susan Chilliday, Bill Whitliff. Chilliday was a writer on Zwick's 30-something TV show, and Whitliff previously co-wrote, get this, Roger, The Black Stallion and Honeysuckle Rose. Big talents worthy of attention. You know, uh... 
I hope they're all nominated, but the one that intrigues me, because until you just mentioned it, it hadn't occurred to me, Cameron Diaz. And what's interesting there is you're quite right. When we see a beautiful, sexy woman in a tight dress, we immediately dismiss her as an actress and look at her as an object. Right. And if we de-objectify that performance, we can find that it indeed is a performance and a very funny one, and it's hard to see because of all the glitter. And I tell you, you could put, we see gorgeous women in movies and good looking men in, in movies, and we know when they're blank. Yeah. Right? We know yeah. when it's just a body. She was this, present. She this was, is more than just a body. She was present and accounted for. Coming up next, we lobby the Academy with our own best picture hopefuls. Continuing our memo to the Academy, now we want to instruct voters how to mark their nominating ballots in the best picture <laughs> category. And there are two films that I think are very likely to be nominated. Two good films Forrest Gump and quiz show. Beyond that, it's anybody's guess. But my dream for a Best Picture nomination is Hoop Dreams, the amazing basketball documentary, three hours long, that is about so much more than basketball. Hoop Dreams follows two inner city kids for five years, from eighth grade through their freshman year in college, as they try to become professional basketball players. They go to a white suburban high school that was the launching pad for NBA star Isaiah Thomas. That's where their paths divide. Arthur Agee's family eventually will have trouble paying his bills. But at first, everything is rosy. I'm, I can't promise you where you're going to go and if you're going to be a star, but I guarantee that I would help you get into the school that would be best for you. And William Gates, a sure bet to become a star, has trouble adjusting. Why do you have to do something unnecessarily? If you would have kept it over here, William, look at me. If you would have kept it over here, why? You could have gone all the way. What is that crap, the shovel pass? And I haven't even scratched the surface in telling you their stories. You couldn't predict at any point how this picture was going to turn out. The filmmakers, Peter Gilbert, Fred Marks, and Stephen James, got total access to the lives of the A.G. and Gates families, and their access becomes ours. The result is something so rare in American movies, an intimate portrait of lower-income lives, which in terms of hopes and dreams for their children are, on one level, no different than anyone else's, but in other ways, in some practical ways, are worlds apart. The biggest celebration, for example, in Hoop Dreams is not a basketball victory, but of one of the boys reaching his 18th birthday. Boy, does that hit home. Many of his friends do not reach 18. Hoop Dreams is one of the five best pictures of the year. It deserves to be nominated as such. I am 100% with you about this. You know, the category doesn't say best fiction film. Mm -hmm. It says best picture. Right. Hoop Dreams is a picture, and it is one of the best pictures of the year. Sure it is. And I just hope that the Academy is able to get out of its orientation around fiction films long enough to just look at this movie and to say, this year, our industry, which we take so much pride in, has done an extraordinary thing in producing this movie, Hoop Dreams, mm -hmm. and we want to honor it because there are not five better movies in yeah. the whole world that we can put above well, it also, on our I, list. Listen, I know there are people out there that are fans of this picture, but I would say to them is, don't think that the documentary branch is going to take care of it with an award, because no. the documentary branch has historically proven to be the, one of the most unreliable. They tend to resent films that achieve notoriety, documentaries, and want to protect even smaller films. So if you're going to do something for Hoop Dreams, do it in the lead category, because it may not be even nominated in the documentary I agree with category. you on that, and everybody can vote for Best Picture, whereas the other categories right. are more specialized. Go and for you're it. right about the documentary branch being okay. totally out to lunch. Another film I hope the Academy doesn't also avoid is Quentin Tarantino's Pulp Fiction, which was the year's most popular film among a lot of younger moviegoers and on the campuses. What its fans enjoyed was the way Tarantino constructed dialogue that was fresh and offbeat and very funny in a screenplay that was also very unexpected. This movie was as much fun to listen to as to look at. Here, for example, is the scene at a trendy restaurant between hitman John Travolta and gun mole Uma Thurman. A five dollar shake. Anyone with that shake, Martin and Lewis or Amos and Andy? Martin and Lewis. Did you just order a five dollar shake? Mm-hmm. That's a shake. That's milk and ice cream. Last I heard. That's five dollars. You don't put bourbon in or nothing? Now, some people might think Pulp Fiction has a lock on a nomination, but that's not what I hear. The Academy loves feel-good movies with positive messages which enhance its image. It does not like raunchy comedies about seamy lowlifes and sleazy criminal types. But Pulp Fiction is the most original and new work to come out of Hollywood this year, 
And if the Academy voters take their jobs more seriously than their public relations, they'll bite the bullet and give the movie the nomination I think it deserves. Oh, I think it's one of the five best pictures of the year, mm -hmm. too. I, I think that so many people have gotten good notices off of this film, yeah. Roger, uh -huh. that I don't think you have to worry about this one. I think it will be a nomination. I think, I think that we've seen the career of Travolta energize. I think he'll be a mm -hmm. sure bet as a nominee and for Bruce Best Picture. So mm -hmm. I think there'll be a lot of groundswell support. A lot of people are going to want to work with Tarantino, and so they'll nominate this I film. I hope you're right. That's it for this special memo to the Academy. Next week, we'll be back with some of the New Year's new releases, including Christian Slater as a lawyer and Kevin Bacon as his convict client in Murder in the First, and also Bad Company with CIA agent Lawrence Fishburne, reluctantly paired with ambitious Ellen Barkin. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. Alcohol-free Rembrandt Mouth Refreshing Rinse is gentler on your mouth, yet fights bad breath bacteria as well as or better than mouthwashes with alcohol. New Ricola Natural Herb Sugar-Free Throat Lozenges, imported from Switzerland. Same great taste and effective relief naturally. It's America's favorite jelly bean, Jelly Belly, now appearing at theaters and video stores with good taste. Jelly Belly Beans, try them, you'll love them. Vicks Sinex, the only sinus spray with a deep... Theater, Jeeves and Wooster 4, Part 2.